Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about downpour, and more generally, I'm here to talk about making creative tools, which is a thing I do. Um, but before I made tools, oh, hello, this is me sitting at the back of the stage. Um, so yeah, before I made creative tools, I used to be a game designer. Uh, and like quick history of my experiences being a game designer, I started off and I was making bad advert games. Here's a game we made for Zalia Banks. Uh, yeah, um, this was based on my experiences of flying in a dream. That's how the motion for this kind of came about. Uh, and then I got a job working on this game, Metacione, uh, which you might recognize if you have visited the arcade tent. Um, and then I was doing some weird like alt control stuff, so I made a thing called the Doom Piano which is kind of as it sounds. It's a piano you can play Doom on. Uh, and then these two kind of things, can, like indie, indie dev and alt control stuff, kind of merged. And I worked at a startup making this, uh, Beasts of Balance, which was a stacking game that was also an iPad game, um, which is, is still for sale now, which I consider a huge success. Um, but the company um, got acquired by Niantic, so I went to work for them for a few years, and where I worked on nothing I can tell you about. So instead, I'm going to show you a slide of some money. <laughs> uh, and then I quit to not make video games anymore. Um, so yeah, what did, what did I do instead? Well, I already kind of told you, right? I made creative tools. Um, creative tools. Um, exactly. Um, but not creative tools like this, uh, although I am really into pottery now, so actually maybe I should start making um, tools for making pottery with. Uh, no, I'm still making software. Um, I'm still making software. I'm still making, yeah, these things called creative tools. So what do I kind of mean by when I say creative tools? It's, it's stuff that you can use to be creative. It's stuff that you can use to make other things. Um, so I'm making things that other people can use to make things. And I guess especially with this stuff, what I'm trying to make is I'm trying to make not something that you use for your job to do the thing that you know how to do, but I'm trying to make tools that let people make something that they've not made before or that they don't feel confident in making, something that allows people to make something that they otherwise wouldn't have made. And that's, that's a thing I find really exciting because then they make some stuff that they wouldn't have made otherwise and you get to see that kind of change in the world. So um, let's do a little demo of Downpour, um, the tool I've made, so you have some idea of what I'm talking about. Um, and give a second. Hey, look, that worked. So yes, this is downpour. You can see uh, my slides inside here. Uh, so yeah, let's let's make a little game in this. Uh, so made a new game, made the first page. Um, let's add a photo to it. I'm going to just choose one of you to take a photo of. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have our first thing. Uh, so when we tap on your face. It turns into a picture of, who wants their face to be in this? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, you know, like, this is, a, this is a pretty small, dumb game, but we have a thing you can tap on, and it turns into something else. And you can quickly easily see that, you know, you could add a second face here. In fact, let's, let's just do that. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if we tap on you, who, who wants their face in this? Come on. <laughs> I didn't really expect to be running around quite as much as this. Uh, anyway, yeah, look, look, here's a video game. You can make one choice, uh, or you can make another choice. And either way, you get a response. So that's, I think that counts as a game. Uh, so what should we call this? We shall call this uh, Faces, and I'm now going to upload it, and now um, we can load it in a browser, and this is now online, and you can send the link to share to people. So if you go to downpour.games slash tilde v slash faces, um, then you can then view this. Um, yeah, so yeah, we've made a game. 
Uh, and that's, that's what Downpour is about. It's a thing that lets you make a game really quickly and really stupidly. Um, let me actually just do something to show off something else that's on here at EMF. So if I rename this so that the title also has EMF in, uh, this uh, game will now be um, available to play at the arcade. <laughs> uh, so if you now go visit the arcade, there will now be a new game available to play at the arcade has been made live on stage. Um, great. That's the demo bit. Um, so yeah, what have I learned from making creative tools like this? Uh, if you were also going to make creative tools, what like you know, larger structural advice would I give you? Obviously, I've got lots of small things I could say, but you know, big philosophical questions. Um, the first thing I would say is think small. Um, by which I mean, don't you don't need to make something that can do everything. Um, you know, if you're making a big professional piece of software, if you're making Photoshop or Unity or I don't know, any of the Adobe products or whatever, they need to cover the whole range of things that people might do because they're using it for their job. But if you're making something that allows people to be creative, then having something that can do one thing and it has very deliberate limitations in it is really empowering. Um, so here's an example of this. Um, this is a, a little thing that um, my friend Andy Wallace made in Pico 8. Um, so it's a little spinning playing card where you can see the back of it and you can see the front of it, um, ace of diamonds. Uh, and here is the code that generated it. So Andy likes to um, write this kind of like tweet code thing. So this is 280 characters which generates the things on the left. Um, and you know, like, would he have made this without the constraint? No, it would be a different thing. And the constraints come from the tool Pico 8, this like great kind of constrained game making tool. And the constraints come from saying, oh, I'm going to try to do this in 280 characters. But the constraints inspire you to try to make something that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, partly because they reduce down the problem and they say, hey, here's, here's, here's some stuff that lets you do this really quickly, you know, like the fact that you can make graphics really straightforwardly and kind of easily and without too much indirection is one reason that this stuff works. But the other part of it is by having the constraints, people are like, oh, how can I try to like, do something that you wouldn't expect you could do within these constraints? Like you could do lots of stuff with computers, but by setting extra constraints there, it ends up being this really powerful like driver to creativity. Um, and so, yeah, there is a, a nice example of this um, by Mike Cook. So this is a game where Made in Downpour where you play tic-tac-toe, uh, or noughts and crosses as I call it. I don't know, it's some cultural thing there. Uh, so yeah, let's play together. Um, I'm going to say, uh, yeah, so it's player one's turn. I'm going to say this half of the room is player one. This half of the room is player two. So player one, yell out which square you want me to go in. Middle. 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 I think this is not actually the optimal um, Norton Crosses play, but you know, you've made a choice. Uh, Corner. Bottom left. Bottom left. OK. Player one. Bottom left. Bottom left? <laughs> bottom middle. OK. OK. <laughs> Player two, you're in peril. Where do you want to go? OK, OK. There's some unanimity here. Top left. Top left? Bottom right. Bottom right, yeah, OK. Left. Left. Right. 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 Yeah. And I'm going to just put you in this, this spot. And it's a tie. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a, a game of tic-tac-toe made inside Downpour. And the thing about Downpour is it doesn't actually have any like state or variables or logic that you can put in other than just you can tap on a thing and you can go somewhere else. Um, which kind of brings up the question of like, how did Mike make this? Um, so if we go back to the slides, we can see a quote from it. Uh, he ended up just generating all of the different possible states that a game of tic-tac-toe can be in as an image. And then he generated the uh, save the, like the, the data of J Jason, the Jason data of a downpour game that would link between these things. Um, and you can even see the little commentary bits at the bottom. 
um, where, which is also procedure generators. And like, he did this because he's just a person who's really into procedural generation and likes doing this kind of weird stuff. Um, but I feel it's kind of powerful. Like, he wouldn't have made a, ga a noughts and crosses game otherwise. Why would he have made that? But the fact of trying to do it because it's perverse, that's a real incentive. Um, let me actually just tap across, because I do have the source code of it, if you want to <laughs> let me scroll through. This is, that's just the assets. This is the actual pages uh, included here. So yeah, you can see, you know, well, it's a win for player one today, but I think player two will be happy with how they handled things. <laughs> so yeah, you can see all of, this, all of this saved. I think this is 18 megabytes of JSON data here generated. It could have been smaller. It wasn't, it wasn't as neat as he could have been. Um, anyway, yeah. So uh, now we come on to uh, this, which is a game someone's made in Downpour, which is a game of chess. Uh, so uh, we play white and go first. The whole, whole, whole audience, which, which piece do we own it? Pawn or a knight? Pawn? Great. Which, which one? Third, third from left. One or two spaces? One. Two. two. Aggressive, yeah. <laughs> okay. Flags move. This is this as AI, yeah. Okay, so we've got the therefore moving forwards. And now. Oh. <laughs> So, you know, you can get around constraints without having to code. You could just go for the joke, which is also, I think, really the point of Downpour is just making, making dumb jokes, uh, so, which is why I love that, that chess game quite so much. Um, yeah, next lesson. People find their own uses for tools. Um, I, this is something I, I've been collecting this little like Twitter thread of um, different examples of this that I find. Like, really, I find it so powerful the way that people are tool using creatures and you don't need to have a tool made to solve your task in order to find a way to solve that task for yourself. Um, so, you know, if, for example, you were trying to uh, clipper the back of your own head, that's a difficult thing to do. I've done that before. Uh, it's difficult to see because it's the back of your own head. You need to have some, uh, I don't know, arrangement of mirrors or something like that. Or you could use a little, uh, you know, camera with a live preview on a TV screen in front of you. That's a way to solve the tool. These things were not made to, to solve the how do you clipper your own head, but you can make it work. And if you wanted to design uh, a garage, you wanted to build a garage, and you were trying to figure out how to do these plans, there's software tools for that. Excel. <laughs> <laughs> And you can design a garage this way. You can figure it out. It's a useful tool. And if that's the thing that you know how to use, it's not going to stop you. Um, and if you wanted to stop your computer from going to sleep, how do you make that work? The answer is you use your watch. Um, because you can put these things together in any combination of ways, and they will fit together. They will do something. Um, and if you want to build a tool that can enable people to do this, well, one, congratulations, they'll do it anyway. And two, yeah, actually, and the, the important thing when you're trying to design this stuff is to really think about trying to make it so your tool can interoperate with other things and it can plug into lots of other things in lots of different configurations and you don't unnecessarily restrict the way it can be used. Um, and, you know, I'm, again, a game, game designer, so I kind of take the example here of Minecraft. So in Minecraft, there's this, like, logic thing called Redstone. And this is, I mean, this is literally an example I found by Google image searching my um, Redstone contraption. So I don't actually know what this does. But what I am pretty sure about is that the designers of Minecraft were not imagining building this machine when they put Redstone and other blocks involved in it into the game. Instead, they put these blocks into the game and they said, cool, they can combine together in really interesting ways. And we've tested it a bunch of ways to check it doesn't crash. And people can make some cool stuff with this. And they can make some cool stuff with this that they were not necessarily expecting them to make. There are lots of different combinations. Because these blocks can be combined in lots of different ways, They're, they have lots of affordances which can click into each other. Um, 
And obviously, when, when you come to video games, like video games are this great thing because they make their own little private universe where things work in a way and they can connect together and you've built your own little universe where things make sense. Um, but when you're making tools, you take the same logic of, oh, these things should click together, but you want to click together with things that you've not built. Um, you want to make sure that your redstone blocks can connect to Lego. You know, if they can, why not? That's better. And actually, Minecraft also has this, right? Like, um, here's an example of uh, someone showing off a thing that takes OBJ files and turns them into uh, block layouts. There's a ton of these kind of tools. Minecraft was, you know, kind of accidentally um, built in Java. I mean, they didn't accidentally build it in Java, but they made it, built it that way for, for other reasons. Um, but part of that meant that people could decompile it and see how it worked. And last time I looked at this, I think Minecraft has more mods for it than any other video game. Just like hundreds of thousands, a truly staggering number. So it like connects into all of this kind of external code, and there's obviously servers with all their weird logic and stuff like that running on it. Um, yeah, so it's really powerful, and it shows the thing of make something that can connect to other things. So in Downfall's case, it's, it uses JSON files, and there's an export button and an import button, so you can modify stuff, and you can work, still work within the thing there. It's, the JSON is designed, is like somewhat readable, as far as JSON goes, um, and this allows you to extend it. It uses images, it spits out web pages, all of this stuff fits within a larger ecosystem, and trying to fit within that larger ecosystem means it can go further and do more than if it exists in its own little insular video game universe. Um, so yeah, next, next lesson. Um, and I think this is really the big one that a lot of the other ones are like subsets of. The big lesson is think about the whole situation. Um, so what I mean by this is if you're trying to make something where you're trying to make a game, it's not just making a game because that's probably not the whole thing that's going on in someone's life and thinking about the whole context is more powerful. Um, and my thinking on this really got developed. This is going to be a sudden wild tangent, something else. But you know, hold on, it will connect back. My thinking on this was really influenced by this book, More Work for Mother, which is this brilliant book on uh, domestic labor and technology and how that has developed throughout the 20th century in the US. Um, but yeah, very much recommend it. And in the introduction to it, she talks about um, this concept of a work system. How when you're thinking about a particular bit of domestic labor, it's important not just think about that bit of labor in isolation. Um, so for example, like if you're talking about, ah, how does cooking happen? Great, so people have invented the microwave and this changes the way that people cook. And it does, it does change the way people cook. It can shorten the amount of time it takes to cook, cook a meal. Um, in some cases, but it doesn't just have an impact on the way that you cook. If you've got the microwave, suddenly you're going to have way more ready meals. So suddenly, um, maybe the food that you buy lasts longer because it's full of preservatives. Um, you have more trash to dispose of. Suddenly, the labor of who is doing this and who is cleaning up after it changes. You've got more stuff that goes in the bin and less stuff that needs washing up. Um, so the whole, all of these other tasks also get shifted. Um, or to take a kind of more speculative example, um, if we have self-driving cars, which for the record, I don't believe we will, but if we had self-driving cars, it's not just going to change, oh, the act of driving changes. Suddenly it says, oh, what happens to parking spaces? Suddenly you can just send your car off to go park somewhere. So suddenly parking spaces are probably in higher competition. This probably changes the way that we lay out our cities. Uh, in order to make self-driving cars work, maybe you need to tag everyone so that the cars actually know where they are because you can't trust the cameras to be reliable. And so suddenly there's this extra technology. It has these huge impacts on other outlying bits of society. So it's never the case that just changing one bit of technology is going to change just that, that task. Instead, it's going to change like a much larger radius. And thinking about that is really important when you're building a tool, even like a stupid kind of creative tool. Um, so for example, uh, I be built this tool, Cheap Bots Done Quick. Um, I built it about seven years ago, um, back when Twitter was less evil, evil in a different way. Um, and there was a real community of people making, making things for Twitter, making bots for Twitter, and I was really excited by that and wanted to help. So this was a tool that people could use to make these, these Twitter bots. Um, and 
uh, yeah, it was quite, partly inspired by an interview that uh, my friend gave where he was like, oh yes, I feel it's really important to be a programmer in order to make Twitter bots. And I was like, I don't think that's necessary. I think it's technically necessary, but I don't think that's fully necessary. Um, and I say it's a thing for making Twitter bots, but actually, I feel like the reason that this was successful was because I did consider the whole situation and because it, the main problem it solved was not making Twitter bots. Making a Twitter bot is, as I think of it, coming up with the logic for how the thing ought to tweak. But actually, the whole situation is larger than that. The whole task is larger than that. Actually, the difficult part is, how do you host the Twitter bot? If you want it to tweet reliably, you need to put it on a server. And in order to do that, you need to have a server that's running. And in order to do that, you need to have a whole load of like system administrator experience that people don't have. Um, and in order to set the thing up, it's not just figuring out what it ought to tweet. You also need to deal with OAuth which I don't want to deal with OAuth. I mean, I did, because if I dealt with OAuth, it meant that other people wouldn't have to deal with it, and they could just click on the approve with this application thing rather than having to figure out all of that flow in order to accomplish this simple task. And so, yeah, it kind of, it's a tool for making Twitter bots, but the things that it really helped with were not the making Twitter bots part, but the other parts around that task. Um, and yeah, like there was like 50,000 bots made with it over the course of its lifetime, so I feel like that was reasonably successful at bringing down those barriers. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, other problems you might want to solve within this. Uh, oh, there we go. Yes, blank page syndrome. Um, this is again another classic example. Oh, you want to make a game? What are some problems that you face? Making the game is one problem, but a problem that actually comes before that is figuring out what game you do want to make. Um, and so, yeah, I try to solve this within Downport. When you open it up, you're not faced with, here's your empty library of games. Instead, you're faced with, here's some pre-made things that you can open up and mess around with. Um, and so, here is, I think, the best one of these that's within it. Uh, you open it up, what's in the egg? You decide. Uh, and so you can tap on the egg, opens, add a picture here. So now, instead of the task of, oh, you need to make a game, instead the task is, what would be a funny thing to come from this egg? And that is a prompt that is much easier to solve. Most things would be funny, unexpectedly emerging from an egg. I think? I don't know. <laughs> if you've got a better prompt, let me know. If you can think of something that would be completely unfunny to emerge from an egg, I don't know, make that game, just prove me wrong. Constraints, you know? Um, but yeah, like, once you've made a game, oops, let's not close my slides. Um, yeah, once you've made a game, then your attitude to the thing is gonna change and you've made something and hopefully that helps you then make some more games. This even comes into simple things. When you create a new downpour game, the background color is like randomly generated and that gives you something to work off. You know, I, I want to be able to give you something reasonably blank. Um, in uh, cheat bots, it starts with some text, so you've already got something that you can modify, and you're not just starting purely at the blank page. Um, I could do more, actually, honestly, on this problem, but already it's trying to tackle these things that are not within quite the scope of the, you know, supposed problem of help you make a game. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, there's another video game comparison here. Uh, which is like Mario, again, eases you in by giving you simple things that you can then build up on over time. Um, yeah, next problem. And this is honestly one of the hugest ones here is just people kind of looking at the thing and saying, oh no, I, I couldn't do that. That's, that's not a thing, that, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, do you want to make a video game? Eh, I don't, I don't think I can, yeah, and like, I've, I've looked at that. Seems difficult. Um, and that's the thing I really care about trying to like overcome or make kind of more welcome. And you know, like how do you how do you help people do that? I mean, we just talked about one with the blank page syndrome thing, which is giving them some early wins. So if you have opened up downpour and you've put a thing emerging from an egg and then you've put that online, then you've already made a game. So saying, "Oh, I couldn't do that." You can. You've already done you've already done it. Um, and the other thing you can do, and the thing that I really like to do, is uh, you can think about the aesthetics. How you come across is really important with how people see the thing. So uh, here's cheap bots, here's downpour. You'll notice that they're both quite pastel. 
Uh, and this is on purpose because that seems kind of less threatening. In, in Cheatbots, you're writing uh, JSON, and you'll notice it's done in proportional font rather than monospace font. And part of the reason for this is because if you see a monospace font, you think, oh, I'm going to be doing some coding. And then that's scary, and people, people recoil from it. Um, uh, so another example from things that are not mine. Here is Orca, which is a weird uh, indie electronic music thing. And here's Imitone, which is another weird I indie um, music generation thing. And Imitone is clearly designed for people and trying to be friendly and cheerful. And Orca is clearly designed for people who think that they're cool hackers. And honestly, also, that's a good choice, because sometimes you're a programmer and you're not really into music, but you hear, oh, this is a weird, obscure, like, um, obscure programming language. Yeah, cool, I, I, I can play with that. I know I don't know that much about music, but I'm pretty sure I can make something cool happen with this. And so actually, you're going to find Orca more welcoming. But equally, Imitone is aimed at, oh, you can sing and it turns into MIDI. So again, the people who are going to do that are probably going to be less technical and more welcomed by this kind of interface. So yeah, the, the, the way you approach it allows certain people in, and you can design for that, and you can use this um, deliberately. Um, next lesson is be a cockroach. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean make something that can survive in adverse conditions. Um, so. Make something that can survive your neglect. Um, there's some kind, of, some kind of techniques for this. Um, you know, it's easier for something to survive if it doesn't have a server component you need to keep up because servers fall over. They can just fall over at any time and you've got to deal with that. But if you've made the thing and you've distributed it as just an executable file that people can download, that's much easier to survive because someone can just copy it and share it or it's hosted on someone else's infrastructure or it can be hosted on multiple places. Much easier for that to work. Another way of doing this is to open source stuff. You can open source stuff and run a whole huge community um, where people are contributing to it, or you can just dump something online. And I did this with Cheatbots. I dumped that online, um, and I didn't really want to encourage anyone to you know, pat do, run patches or anything like that, because it seemed like a lot of bother. And when it, Twitter pulled it offline, somebody had forked it and put it on Mastodon, so that code is still running somewhere, it's still helpful to people, and I don't even have to run the server anymore. Um, so be a cockroach, but also have fun. Because this is a creative project, this is a creative tool, and people can, I think, sense the vibes that you give off when you're making the tool, and they pick up on the, oh, this is a thing designed for fun, and it's got this creativity going into it. Um, so, for example, when I was making Downpour, I was thinking about all of this stuff that I'm talking about here, but I was also thinking about this pencil case, which I don't think I ever had as a kid, but I definitely thought about a lot as a kid. Uh, and I think you can kind of see the influence on, on the UI of Downpour. It's kind of clicky, kind of pastel colors in the same kind of way. Um, yeah, I, I feel really pleased with this, and I feel like this kind of joy in the UI really comes through. But this isn't even the best example. Honestly, my UI is fine. But um, this is Electric Zine Maker by Natalie Lawhead. It has amazing UI, really cool, interesting stuff. Um, I'm going to skip through this stuff because I'm running out of time. Um, anyway, to end on this, this is the inspiring end bit. You should make creative tools. I mean, if you want to. I don't know. Like, I do this because I care about people making creative stuff. I want to build that community. I want to expand and encourage and get people to do this stuff. And I have the technical cap capability to make tools. So that's the biggest way I kind of have a way of having an influence on that. Um, for other people, maybe you want to curate a show, or you want to organize meetups, or you want to lobby the government for arts funding, or you want to do all of this stuff. It could have just as big an impact. Um, but if you have a kind of technical leaning, then and you care about trying to expand the range of things that people can make, then I would say consider making creative tools. Thank you.